And of course, we, our, our, our team covers the entire Memorial Cal Health System as well as um, some of the surrounding uh, areas for stereotactic body radiotherapy. Um, and uh, uh, essentially, um, you know, my talk today is going to focus uh, primarily on some of the radiation treatment options, and in particular, CyberKnife and stereotactic uh, ablative body radiotherapy. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to probably just walk us through some of the, some of the major um, radiation options and kind of the evolution of radiation over time, and then how we kind of arrived at uh, using CyberKnife for prostate cancer. And then I'll try to focus a little bit in more detail about CyberKnife itself. I understand you've had a number of speakers come in and speak to you about some of the other modalities at, at different points in time. So, um, you know, to this particular group, I'm sure that you're probably aware of some of the major um, options uh, that are out there, including, um, you know, and, uh, you know, I think I usually tell my patients when we're starting off a consultation that, of course, prostate cancer is a spectrum of disease. And it's very important to sort of tailor the aggressiveness of the treatment to the aggressiveness of the disease. And so uh, for today's talk, I'm going to speak in more generalities. So, of course, not every option applies to every patient. And you have to kind of look at the, um, you know, the history of the patient and how aggressive their disease is and then kind of tailor the treatment options accordingly. But in general, people talk about active surveillance. This is usually reserved for um, some of our lower risk patients. Um, surgery, and there's multiple different types of surgery, retropubic, transperineal, laparoscopic, and of course nowadays robotic and nerve sparing. And uh, likewise, within the radiation field, um, there are multiple different radiation modalities, and that's what we'll focus on uh, today. There are also other local modalities like HIFU and cryotherapy, um, which are a little bit less mainstream, so I'm not going to, you know, um, we won't touch on those today. And then, of course, with, with all of these modalities, we sometimes use other treatments like uh, hormonal therapy or systemic agents to kind of manage prostate cancer. So this is just to sort of give a, a, a kind of an eagle eye overview of, of uh, uh, some of the major options that are available there. So uh, let's see here. Okay. So I guess I have to click on the screen here. Um, uh, again, uh, to this particular audience, this is probably uh, not anything new, but uh, you know, the prostate gland um, is located here between the bladder and the rectum. Um, it's approximately the size of a walnut. This is a surgical specimen here that kind of gives you a little bit of a rough idea. This is a centimeter ruler right below there. Um, it's an exocrine gland of the male reproductive system, and it, its primary purpose is that it produces a component of the seminal fluid. Um, one of the things that I'll just kind of, since we have this anatomy slide up here, is if you notice, this is the prostate gland, this is the bladder, this is the rectum, these are the seminal vesicles right here, and then these are some of the lymph nodes right there. So the challenge from the beginning of time uh, for radiotherapy and radiation oncologists has been how do we deliver uh, a high and sufficient enough dose of radiation therapy to the prostate gland itself without damaging the bladder or the rectum, or the urethra, which is the tube that runs right through the center of the prostate gland, you know, which drains the urine from the bladder out the penis. And uh, of course, we want to protect that organ while still treating the prostate gland. And so all of the technology and advancements have kind of focused um, on that. So, um, oh, and, and by the way, I apologize. I hope none of you are eating dinner or are too squeamish because I do have a few kind of uh, uh, slides that might make, so I apologize in advance if, if that's the case. So people just to warn you in advance, there's a few slides that might make some of our, you know, some of you in the audience a little squeamish. So we'll try to speed through those so there's not too much on those ones. Um, so starting off, I'm going to talk about what, you know, broadly is referred to as internal radiation therapy, um, or commonly known as brachytherapy, which is the Greek word for delivering brachytherapy over short distances. Now, um, the most common and oldest form of brachytherapy that's still commonly in use today is known as low dose rate brachytherapy. And essentially what it is, is that before, especially before all of the radiation technology had evolved, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, we didn't have all this fancy computer technology and three dimensional treatments and all these kinds of things. And so people came up with the idea is that instead of delivering radiation externally, from outside inwards, in which case the radiation beams had to pass through a patient, that maybe we could deliver radiation by putting it directly inside of a patient's prostate gland. And by doing that, you could get 
you know, very accurate in terms of controlling for motion of the gland and image guidance, as well as depositing radiation because you're putting it directly internally, you would get less rectal dose and have, uh, you know, confine the radiation dose a little more accurately to the prostate gland. And the way they did that was essentially by um, putting a series of needles directly into the prostate gland via ultrasound guidance, which is what that prior, prior picture showed, and essentially depositing little radioactive pellets or seeds um, directly into the prostate gland itself. And most commonly, we've used iodine-125 or palladium uh, or, uh, to sort of do this. And this is sort of a blown up picture of, of an iodine-125 seed. Now, this picture takes up the entire screen, but in reality, it's the size of like a little tiny grain of rice. And so this is the way the procedure works. Essentially, we insert uh, a, an ultrasound into a patient's rectum. It's very similar to when you get the biopsy done, except that the difference is that we have this transperineal template. And what we do is we put a series of, of, of these needles directly in there. And then we use, this is called a MIC applicator, and we drop uh, little radioactive pellets into the prostate gland. And so this is an x-ray kind of showing all these little radioactive tiny grains of, uh, you know, look like, uh, sorry, grains of rice uh, directly into the patient's gland there. I'm sorry, I'm just moving around a little bit here. So the nice thing about this is that you have the radiation confined to the prostate gland um, and it's directly inside. So, you, you know, you don't have to worry about radiation beams passing through, you know, the hip and the rectum and, and, and kind of other areas. Um, the disadvantage of this is, of course, it's a little bit, um, you know, some patients will look at that and say, oh, this is barbaric. You guys are, you know, putting all these needles in there. Of course, this is done under anesthesia and things like this. But um, one of the issues with it was that um, you can see this is sort of a textbook classical picture of a very good implant. But even in this kind of ideal sort of a textbook implant, you can see here, you know, two or three of the sleeves, they can clump together a little bit so you can get a little bit of a radiation hot spot. And then you see how these two seeds are kind of spaced far apart. And so you can get little cold areas. And so you sort of get a very heterogeneous dose distribution where you can get hot and cold spots. Occasionally, if you don't have an ideal implant, you have to supplement with external beam radiation therapy. And of course, this is very user dependent on the skill of the radiation oncologist and the surgeon, you know, placing these to kind of make sure that they fall in the right place. The other kind of downside to this particular treatment was that um, a patient is radioactive afterwards, so you have to kind of strain your urine because sometimes these can get in the urethra and then you have to, you know, you can urinate these seeds out, so you have to strain your, 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 your um, urine. Um, and in the immediate after uh, effect of having this procedure done, you have to be careful about, you know, having, you know, grandchildren in your lap and being around different people. And occasionally, every once in a while, these seeds can actually migrate if they get into the bloodstream. You know, there's been reports of sometimes the seed can end up in the lung or other areas of the body. So because of that, um, people were constantly trying to figure out, you know, are there better ways to sort of do this? And this, by the way, this is a very efficient and effective method, even though it's decades old, um, it's still used very commonly today. And it's a very good option for low and low intermediate risk. And it's still used even in high risk patients as a combination with external beam treatment. But as time went on, people said, okay, you know, are, are, are there better ways to do this? Is there, is there a newer technique that might work? And so that's when they came up with what's called high dose rate brachytherapy. And, and again, I apologize about this picture, um, but essentially what it is is that they said, instead of putting a whole bunch of radioactive seeds there, they put a series of needles directly into the prostate gland. And I'll, and I'll come off of that picture so that we're not <laughs> dwelling on that while we're, <laughs> while we're eating. Um, and essentially they said, can we, instead of taking hundreds of little radioactive pellets, can we just take a single high dose rate seed and weld it to the end of a cable? We do that using Iridium 192. And essentially what we do is we put those series of hollow needles in, which I showed on the, on the prior screen. And this little radioactive seed travels in and out of those hollow catheters and into the prostate gland and delivers the radiation directly in there. But when it's done, the seed is pulled back out again and goes back into a device that looks like this. And this is a high dose rate brachytherapy after It's sort of like a, um, uh, uh, they call it a robotic controlled system. And essentially those needles are connected to this device via cables and the radioactive source travels from inside of this machine into the prostate gland 
through those needles, delivers the radiation, and then it comes back out again, goes to the next needle, the next needle, the next needle. And once it's finished, it goes back in here and the patient is disconnected and then all the needles are removed. And basically the patient is not radioactive afterwards. They have nothing left inside of the prostate gland, um, which is one of the advantages of, of, of doing the high dose rate brachytherapy. And so this is an example of those cables that are connected. And this is what the radiation looks like at the end of the treatment. Now on this screen, these little green sort of uh, fluorescent dots represent the needles that were placed into the patient's gland. And the nice thing about this is that once we place a needle, let's say these two needles, if they're too close to one another or they're too far apart from one another, we can pull them out and readjust it until we get it to the point where we're pretty happy with it. And so you're not just reliant on these seeds just kind of falling where they may, but instead you can, very, you can much more accurately control where the radiation is going. The other nice thing about this system is that the urethra, which goes right through the center of the gland, you can create a little donut hole around it where most of the time the prostate cancer tends to be in the periphery of the gland. It's less likely to be in the central zone region right around the urethra. And because of that, you can actually spare some of this area from the radiation and deliver more higher doses around the periphery of it. So this is a relic, you know, this came about, uh, this is what the Intel CEO many years ago had and many other, you know, patients had. And it was a very, very nice way to deliver very high doses of radiation over short periods of time. Eventually as the data, and, and, and this is another um, sort of example, this is a three-dimensional image showing the needles going in um, those uh, to the prostate gland. This is the rectum here. This is the bladder here. And you can see this yellow is a very nice dose cloud around the red, which is the prostate gland over here. So this is kind of like a classic um, example of that. Now, this is also just another example of us sparing the urethra here. You know, this is the urethra here in yellow. And you can see this line kind of going around and sparing, you know, getting higher doses. You get this classic sort of horseshoe shape radiation dose distribution around that area. Um, so this, is a very, this was a very nice way to deliver the radiation. The disadvantage, of course, of this is that it is invasive. It does require, um, you know, you, you obviously are not going to stick these needles into somebody without some type of uh, numbing the patient and giving some anesthesia. And of course, these needles have to kind of stay there. And usually this is delivered in, in multiple fractions over, um, you know, uh, typically, uh, you know, there's many multiple different fractions, but the most common one being four fractions. There, there are some uh, institutions now that are even delivering two and just doing one uh, treatment in the morning and one treatment in the afternoon. This can also be used to treat high-risk patients. And the um, when, when treating high or high intermediate risk patients, this is usually combined with external beam radiation where you get external beam and then you boost with this treatment. And some of the data seems, you know, would indicate that this particular form of radiation, when you combine it with external beam radiation, seems to have the highest uh, local control rates. And so oftentimes in patients that have very aggressive cancers, this tends to be a very, very good option. The downside to this is, of course, because you're sticking a series of needles directly into the prostate gland, you can get more swelling of the gland. And so that can sometimes cause more urinary symptoms or urinary side effects, like when you got to go, you got to go, or, or, or cause urinary obstructive symptoms. And so this is not a good, good option for patients who are already having a lot of trouble urinating or with both this option and the uh, LDR option, if a patient has had a prior, what we call TERP or transurethral resection of the prostate gland, the prostate's distorted, or if the um, gland is too large, then these treatments tend to be more difficult. Now, high dose rate is a little bit more forgiving. Sometimes you can still do this treatment even in patients who've had a TERP, but even with the high dose rate, there's a certain size limit when, to when the prostate will become too large and the, uh, the needles will not adequately be able to cover the entire gland. So that is essentially um, a, a, a summary of uh, internal radiation therapy. Now, external radiation therapy has kind of evolved in the same way over time. And, and, and by the way, internal radiation, I didn't get into too much of the detail, but back in the day, 
it used to be, you know, it was ultrasound or CT guided. Now, some of the software and technology with that has evolved over time. Sometimes it's even combined in certain patients that have recurrent disease with hyperthermia, like at our Long Beach um, Center. We actually have needles that will heat up and you can even do the treatments even in patients who had received prior radiation therapy as salvage treatment. So that's another use of the internal radiation. Um, external radiation therapy has started off way, way, many, many decades ago. It started off with, with two-dimensional treatment planning. And um, uh, I, even in my own residency, I remember, um, you know, many radiation oncologists, we'd walk around with these sort of wax pencils in our pocket. And uh, essentially, when somebody came in and they wanted to be treated with radiation, now this is, of course, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, 20, 30 years ago, um, what we would do is we would just take a simple x-ray like this one here and we would literally pull these, this wax pencil out of our pocket and we would say, okay, we know the prostate is somewhere over here. We put a little dye in the bladder and figure out, okay, the bladder is right here and we know the lymph nodes are in this region. And literally we would just take a wax pencil and draw with a ruler these kind of straight lines like this and then we would be like, okay, let's fire away. And so the radiation would go through all of this area, including the rectum and the bladder, and you can see some of the bowel here and the bladder and everything like that. And surprisingly, it still worked relatively well. A lot of patients, you know, benefited from this and were cured from their prostate cancers. But as you can imagine, there were a lot of side effects. Uh, you know, the bladder would get treated, the rectum would get treated, and it limited the total amount of radiation dose you could give because there's only so much you could give when you're kind of shooting blind and you only have a general idea of where the prostate is. The other thing is the prostate tends to move around a lot. And so in order not to miss, we had to treat much bigger areas even when we cone down our treatments so as not to miss. So this was the way treatment was done for, for many, many years. Then we kind of evolved to um, what is known as three-dimensional treatment. And to be honest, this jump from 2D treatment to 3D treatment was probably one of the biggest advances in um, radiation. Um, in, in many, many decades. Because the simple fact is that when you could do a CAT scan, you could get a three-dimensional idea of exactly where the prostate gland is, as well as the rectum, and as well as the bladder. And so this simple fact allowed you to much more accurately treat where the prostate is. And this is an example of a simple 3D plan. It's, this is called a four field box plan. You know, we used to refer to it as that, where basically you'd use one beam from the front, one beam from the back, and, one be and two beams from the side. So each beam would give 25% of the dose. And so just by doing this, you've got 100% of the dose going here, and you've got 25% of the dose going through all the other organs. The other nice thing that you could do is you could put special blocks into the head of the machine to kind of be in the same shape as the prostate gland. And just that simple advance made radiation a lot more effective and allowed us to increase the amount of dose that we could safely give, which would, you know, which increased the uh, cure, you know, the, the, the cure rate of the prostate and reduced the side effects. But then they didn't stop there, you know, computer technology continued to evolve and essentially they came up where they went from 3D treatment to what's called IMRT or intensity modulated radiation therapy. And that was essentially a way where they put these little, instead of having these kind of Cerebin blocks that they used to put in the head of the machine and our therapists would lift them up and stick them into the head of the machine, they ended up with this thing called a multi-leaf collimator where it was a computer controlled system in the head of the machine where these leaves could kind of move in and out of the head of the machine and shape the radiation dose in the exact shape of the patient's prostate gland, uh, as well as in you know, uh, uh, blocking the rectum and the bladder and things like that. So basically you ended up with much tighter radiation treatments. And instead of just using four fields, people started using you know, six fields or seven fields. Like for example, in this case, there's six fields here. So each field now has one sixth of the dose coming through. The other thing that happened is when an intensity modulated radiation therapy came into play, these, these leaves could move in and out of the head of the machine and modulate the intensity of the radiation. That's the, hence the name intensity modulated radiation therapy. So that's where you got IMRT from. 
So that allowed you to, to, to make dose gradients or do what's called dose painting, where you could, you could start with a very high dose and slowly fade it away into a lower dose uh, you know, as it got closer to the rectum and the bladder. So that really, really improved treatments. But then of course, the physics guys and the technical teams and the engineers and the doctors continued to evolve. And they went from IMRT to what is done in the present day at many of the advanced cancer centers. Most of the advanced cancer centers now have what's called 4D treatment, which is basically controlling for the motion of the prostate gland. So the prostate gland, as many of you know, it's not a stationary organ. It doesn't just sit there, even though our, our wonderful cartoons make it look like that. In reality, the prostate gland is always moving around, depending on what you had for breakfast that morning as the rectum is filling and emptying and as the bladder is filling and emptying, because we're alive, we're human beings. So of course, it's not a stationary organ. So what we used to do is we used to just treat a bigger area. But when you do that, you know, so that we don't miss, you're treating more of the rectum and the bladder. So now we have these 4D image guided techniques and there's multiple different ones that are used. You know, there's cone beam, there's calypso, there's KV images, there's fiducial gold seed markers. But essentially, all of these things, what they do is they allow uh, the new modern radiation machines to control for the motion of the gland. Um, and then you can treat much more accurately, so you can treat smaller margins with better targets. And finally, IMRT has now evolved. Again, a lot of the more advanced centers are using what's called ARC therapy which is that instead of just using six or seven beams, now, if you look here at this picture right here, you see all these little yellow dashes. These are hundreds of little beams that are coming in a circular fashion, 360 degrees around the patient's body. And so each beam, is, they're using hundreds of beams, so it's spreading the dose around where each individual beam is one one hundredth of the dose, and they're intersecting directly on the prostate gland. And so you've got this nice curvature of the dose, much tighter doses around. This picture here shows the bladder and you can see the prostate is nicely covered with very little dose to the bladder and the rectum. So that's kind of the modern evolution of uh, radiation therapy. Now, the other advance that um, has come about more recently, this, is, this has probably been in the last you know, five, 10 years, um, and now it's being more commonly used, uh, especially here in Orange County, um, is what's called a hydrogel rectal spacer or the space OAR. Uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Dan Hamstrong, I actually, uh, you know, he and I trained together at Michigan. Um, he was one of the um, uh, primary authors on the initial publication for this, for this study. And uh, essentially, it's a relatively simple concept, but um, no matter how fancy our radiation therapy got, um, if, as, as many of the men here probably know, when the doctor examines the rectum, what they do is they stick their finger in the rectum and then they feel the prostate gland. And the reason they're able to do that is because the prostate gland is actually flush with the rectum. So no matter how fancy of a radiation treatment you deliver, you can have the most high-tech radiation treatment in the world. And if you're going to cover this posterior portion of the prostate gland, you're always going to treat a little bit of the rectal wall. And so the idea was that if we could inject this gel, hydrogel, in between the prostate and the rectum, that you could essentially create a space between those two organs and push the rectum out of the field. And then when you deliver this fancy radiation treatment, you are not delivering as much dose to the rectal wall and therefore you reduce the side effects. And so that's what this picture here shows. This hydrogel is placed in between the rectum and the prostate, thereby protecting the rectum uh, uh, from you know, the radiation when you're delivering it here. And the additional thing is very interesting, later on I'll talk about this, but when the cyber knife treatment, initially we were a little skeptical as to whether this would really help much because of the accuracy and precision of some of the more advanced radiation treatments, including cyber knife. But what we found was that because it, it, uh, it spared the rectum, it allowed our planners a lot more degrees of freedom when they're coming up with their radiation plan such that they're actually able to deliver less radiation even to the urethra and the bladder. And that's what the clinical studies have actually shown, that not only do you reduce the rectal toxicity, but because it gives more degrees of freedom for the radiation planners, you also tend to reduce bladder and urethral toxicity as well. This bottom picture here is, is, is uh, uh, an MRI scan, which just kind of shows this is the rectum, this is the prostate, this is without the hydrogel spacer, this is with the space OAR in between there, showing this nice separation. 
And then people always ask me, okay, well, what happens to this? Is just to stay in me forever? No, it, it does dissolve. It's made out of a, a biodegradable material that about 12 months later, you can see in this picture that um, all of the uh, space OAR has disintegrated uh, and uh, the patient has gone kind of back to um, normal now. So um, let me take a quick look here. Okay, the other thing this picture here just shows what a typical radiation oncologist will be looking at. We have these things called dose volume histograms where we measure, uh, you know, we, we generate these nice fancy graphs to sort of generate um, to, you know, that basically outline exactly what percentage of the prostate is being covered by radiation and then what percentage of these critical organs. And the idea is you always want to keep these curves low and this curve high. And basically the bottom line is with all of these fancy radiation techniques, we've been able to increase the amount of dose of radiation that we're able to deliver. And jokingly, uh, you know, uh, one of my uh, mentors had, had, had told me this during residency, that if you give a higher, high enough dose of radiation, um, you can pretty much kill any cancer on the planet. But of course the problem is that you also uh, destroy, uh, uh, you know, you hurt the patient by doing that. So, the, 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 the sort of golden rule in radiation has been you want to try to give as high of a dose as you can while giving as little dose to the surrounding organs. And all of these techniques have allowed us to do that in a way that um, has resulted in approximately a 20% increase in biochemical control rates because we're using much higher doses of radiation, but simultaneously reducing the toxicity, which is phenomenal, which is exactly you know, what you want to do. So this has been a, a very, very good thing. This is a typical linear accelerator. This is uh, similar. This is a, a picture of one that we use in our clinic um, at, at, at all three of our centers have, have a similar system in place. This is a gentleman laying on the a linear accelerator and this is a system that would deliver in 360 degrees around the patient um, in a circular fashion, okay? So this, this, the head of the machine, it can only go in a circle around the patient, but it's a very effective treatment, you know, to sort of deliver it. This is what a modern, um, linear accelerator looks like in terms of delivering radiation uh, 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 using of what we call VMAT or a volumetric modulated arc technique. And essentially what happens is that, uh, you know, there's a um, electron gun in the head of this machine that shoots, you know, electrons at high energy. It hits a tungsten target, which generates the photons, which then delivers the radiation. On the bottom of this machine, there is a, a, a basically um, a kilovoltage imager actually on the arms of the machine that are enable us to do the image guidance. Um, and uh, the head of the machine is where that multi-leaf collimator is. And so this is actually, this is probably a little bit better picture. So these arms here, this is the one that, that generates the KV images that allows people to do comb beam and to take, uh, you know, to check, you know, to lock onto fiducial markers. The head of the machine is where the radiation, this is the business end where the radiation comes out. This, th this, there's also an arm here that can come out and take additional images. Uh, to verify positioning and things like that. But essentially this is what, um, uh, you know, the modern linear accelerators have. We also, we, we're, we're a little bit lucky at some of our centers, we have some of the newer technology, but we have a robotic couch now that can also control for uh, motion of the gland, which kind of rotates patients and adjusts for pitch and yaw, which is another, um, you know, nice feature of, of, of uh, some of the newer technology. So that's that. So now we'll jump into the cyber knife and I just want to be cognizant of time here. Um, I think we have till about uh, eight o'clock, right? And we want to leave some time for questions and answers if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Okay, perfect. So I will try to, you know, I'll try to wrap up with the cyber knife um, and then I'll leave, I'll try to leave enough time to kind of ask, uh, you know, for people to answer, you know, have their questions answered. So this is, um, this is the center that I'm actually the medical director of. This is an actual picture from that center. It's a picture of our cyber knife unit, which we're very proud of. Um, we were very fortunate. Our group was actually the first uh, group in the United States. We had the very first uh, 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 commercial based uh, uh, cyber knife unit. This was originally developed at Stanford by a neurosurgeon by the name of Dr. Adler, and it was used to treat uh, brain, you know, tumors in the brain. So we initially staffed uh, the original model of this once they had released it uh, to the general public. Um, and then uh, eventually we, uh, you know, the Fountain Valley Center was built and then we moved um, our clinic over here. And, and now we're based out of uh, Orange Coast Memorial and we've been continuing uh, the treatment since then. So 
This has been an operation in Orange County uh, for prostate cancer. It's been used roughly for about 10 years in, uh, you know, in Orange County and, um, you know, and, and in the United States in general, this is probably one of the longest uh, experiences that we've had in the country with it. Um, there's other centers in San Diego. There's a doctor, Dr. Don Fuller, I think, who's also spoken to you at some point, um, who is, you know, one of the primary individuals who initially started using uh, uh, CyberKnife for prostate cancer, along with uh, uh, Dr. Chris King and some of my other colleagues. But um, essentially, what this is is this is a miniaturized linear accelerator. So that big giant machine I showed you on the first picture has been shrunken down and mounted on the head of a Japanese uh, robotic system. And some of you may be familiar with this. This is what they use on the auto assembly lines. You know, I told you I'm originally from Michigan. So this is what they also use to assemble cars and things like that. But instead of taking, uh, you know, the bolts and, the, and this kind of thing on top of it, they've actually put a linear accelerator on it. They've made, they've designed this robotic couch. And these are KV imagers that are in the head of the, of the ceiling. And these are flat panel detectors in the floor. Um, and I'll explain also, we have an infrared camera, it's kind of off view here, but, uh, but essentially this is what the, what the basic system looks like. Now, before we jump into that, um, I'm gonna just throw, you know, you, many of you may have heard different terms thrown around. So I'm just gonna quickly define some of them. Uh, SRS stands for stereotactic radio surgery. That was the original term used when they were treating brain tumors and things like that with single fraction uh, treatment where they were just delivering one treatment. Stereotactic body radiotherapy, or SBRT, refers to when you treat with multiple sessions, um, and that's a form of the, and CyberKnife is one of the forms of that. Um, some of our colleagues prefer the term SABER. One is because it's a very clever acronym, you know, kind of like a sword or a SABER, but, um, but essentially that stands for stereotactic ablative right radiotherapy, and that's the same thing. So SBRT, SABER, CyberKnife, or extreme hypofractionation. These are all interchangeable terms that essentially refer to similar methods. Extreme hypofractionation is, refers to any you know, method of delivering very high doses of radiation, typically in the United States in five or less treatments. And then CyberKnife is the name of a machine that can do, it's a robotic radiation system that can deliver all of these types of things. It's one of the systems that's utilized uh, for the treatment, you know, for, for, for uh, doing uh, SBRT or SABER. Um, so what is the cyber knife specifically? So first of all, it is uh, not a real knife. Um, that is, uh, you know, it's rather a virtual one. There's no um, actual uh, cutting involved with it. Um, the other thing is that it is a system of delivering high doses of radiation with high degrees of precision and accuracy. Because of the nature of CyberKnife, you can deliver something with sort of submillimeter precision. So for example, if I wanted to treat something on the head of a pen, a pen like this, you can treat something with that level of accuracy, even less than the breadth of a hair. And even a few millimeters away, you have very little radiation, also, which is the reason we were able to treat tumors in very sensitive areas like behind the eye or in the optic chiasm or you know, on the spinal cord and things like that. And that was the original use of the CyberKnife. Um, Physically, what it is, is that it's a, as I mentioned, it's a miniaturized 6MV linear accelerator that's mounted on a computer controlled robot. It uses a frameless system because the old gamma knife systems, they used to actually have to bolt a frame into the head, which they no longer, um, you know, with, the, with these newer systems, they don't do that. And it has a real time image guidance system to deliver hundreds, usually we use, you know, a few hundred beams of non-isocentric, non-coplanar beams for either radio surgery, which is one fraction, or radiotherapy, which is two to five. Now, I know that's probably a mouthful, and uh, yeah, as they say, clear as mud. Um, you know, this might not mean anything to you. But um, essentially, what that means is that instead of delivering the doses in a circular fashion, 360 degrees, it can do it in a spherical fashion. It can come from any angle, from, from multiple different angles, you know, so you're not just stuck to a circle, but actually a sphere. Um, so this is the components, as I mentioned, the accelerator, the manipulator, the imaging system, which is these x-ray sources in the head of the wall, I mean, in the ceiling and in the floor. Um, there's a targeting software which takes all of this information and in real time immediately adjusts the machine to the motion of the gland. And this is probably, oops, this is probably one of the biggest uh, things that is different with the CyberKnife system compared to other systems. 
in most other radiation systems, you have to immobilize the patient. You have to put special, you know, back locks or, or do ki different kinds of things to make sure the patient holds absolutely still and is not moving during the radiation. This employs the exact opposite philosophy. This one, the, the, the prostate will move around and instead of the patient holding still, the machine will actually follow uh, the motion of whatever target it's following. So instead of, um, uh, you know, having the patient lay absolutely still, the machine itself will immediately image and say, oh yeah, this is where the correction is, and then it'll move to, to account for that target. Um, so many of the image guidance systems, what it does is it just says, okay, if the prostate is within the sphere, it's good, but if it moves out of it, you can't actually move the machine to adjust for it. What you do is you have to move the table or the patient to adjust for that motion, versus this can continuously adjust for, for, for that motion. And that's, and that's one of the big advantages of the CyberKnife system. So in general, at our particular center, typical prostate patient, you know, um, usually the process is that they'll have a consult with us, they will have uh, fiducial markers placed by a urologist. Um, these are usually gold seeds, and there's an there's example right there. That's what the cyber knife will lock onto so that it can control, you can have that real-time image guidance. Um, typically with modern radiotherapy, and particularly with the cyber knife, uh, unless there's a contraindication, we usually try to get an MRI for the patient because it allows for much higher resolution in terms of our treatment planning. And especially nowadays, because we're using space OAR, we usually do uh, an MRI. Um, our particular process, uh, we try to use a Foley if the patient is able to have a Foley catheter in for the scan. And the reason is because that way we're able to identify the urethra and spare the urethra because we use more of a brachytherapy-like planning model. Now, you can also do it without a Foley and have a homogeneous model, but of course, then you can't spare the urethra as accurately. The other thing that the Foley catheter does is because we do it, we have it at the time of the MRI and the, and the SIM, we're able to more accurately fuse the gland and the urethra during the planning uh, process. Then we do the treatment planning, and then finally the patient gets their treatment, typically about five treatments for, for a lower, low intermediate risk patient, and then of course the follow-up and the surveillance. So I'm going to make an attempt. I hope this is going to work. You know, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. This is a, a video that I'm going to show you. This is from the uh, Accure uh, company. So, um, you know, of course, they, they have their own little commercial bias to so take it with a little bit of grain of salt, but it does a very nice job kind of explaining to give you a little bit of an overview of what a typical um, uh, thing would look like here. So I'm going to go ahead and play this and then I'll stop it in the middle here. And I don't know if the volume will work, but we'll, we'll give it a shot. If not, I'll give some commentary. Treating prostate tumors with radiation or surgery is challenging. The prostate's proximity to other sensitive organs, like the bladder and rectum, require pinpoint accuracy to avoid damaging healthy tissue and nerves. CyberKnife, the first and only robotic radiation system. Using advanced imaging and real-time motion synchronization, the CyberKnife system continually adjusts to your prostate's unpredictable movements, allowing this non-surgical treatment to deliver high doses of radiation precisely to the prostate in only four to five sessions, generally in just one week. Compared to as many as 45 with traditional radiation therapy over nine weeks, traditional radiation therapy systems do not automatically adjust to movement. The radiation is therefore targeted at an area that overlaps with nearby healthy tissue and organs to ensure that the prostate is always covered. This requires lower doses per session to spare the healthy tissue, and therefore many more trips to the radiation therapy center. Surgical procedures for the treatment of prostate tumors require a hospital stay and risk surgical complications, such as infection, incontinence, and a painful recovery. The CyberKnife system uses X-ray imaging to track the prostate's unpredictable movements by continually adjusting the radiation beam with its robotic arm to target the prostate with high precision and accuracy without any surgical cuts. Not only does this mean no overnight hospital stay, but it allows for short treatment and recovery time. The submillimeter accuracy with which the CyberKnife system delivers radiation to the prostate can also be applied to tumors of the brain, head and neck, spine, lung, breast, liver, pancreas, kidney, and more. The CyberKnife system is clinically proven and has been used to treat thousands of prostate cancer patients. 
It is also safe and effective when used in combination with a variety of other techniques, giving new hope for patients with recurrent tumors, even those which have previously received radiation. The CyberKnife system delivers precise robotic treatment as individual as every patient. The okay, I'm, I'm going to stop it there because, I mean, that just gives a general idea. Obviously, that this is the company designing this, so you have to kind of take this with a grain of salt because this is, uh, you know, their video. But, but it gives a little bit of an idea as to what, you know, the overall, uh, you know, the way the system works and, uh, uh, you know, the way that the treatments are, are delivered. Now, um, let's see if I can get to the next. Oops, I was going to try to play that again. Okay. So let me just make sure that's the right slide, yeah. Okay, so the rationale, why do we use CyberKnife for prostate cancer? Um, you know, I like to say that it, it tends to combine the best features of all of the existing radiation technologies by combining modern external beam advancements with traditional brachytherapy concepts, which is basically the internal radiation. So. On the one hand, you have the continual image guidance throughout the treatment, which is similar to HDR and LDR, you know, where you're actually putting the seeds directly in there. It's a non-invasive treatment, which is different, you know, which is more like the external beams like Proton or 3D or IMRT. Um, the treatment can be delivered in five treatments or less, which is similar to HDR and CyberKnife. It does not require anesthesia, which is similar to the external beam treatments, and it does not require an operative procedure, which is also similar to the external beam. So you kind of get you know, you get a mix of the best of both worlds. The other thing is that, of course, it's convenient. A lot of guys would rather come five times than four to 45 times, you know, over eight to nine weeks, which is what traditional radiation does. Um, the other nice thing is that, of course, it controls for intrafraction motion, meaning that not just interfraction motion. So many of the radiation systems between fractions, they can control, but during the actual radiation, they can't control for the motion. So what m most radiation systems do is that they will lock on, you know, they'll say, okay, the prostate moved here, they'll treat the target of the day but they won't treat the target of the moment, meaning that once it's, if it's shifting within the radiation, they can't control for that. They can only control for the systemic you know, error uh, uh, in a more accurate fashion, but this actually controls for movement during the radiation itself, um, which, is, which is one of the advantages of that. And then of course, there's a theoretical radiobiologic advantage because data indicates that prostate cancer, because of its, it, the, the, the nature of the way that the cells divide, that it may respond better to larger doses given over shorter periods of time rather than um, over a prolonged period of time. And so there is some uh, uh, you know, radiobiologic advantages in that sense also. Now, the other thing that we've done, our particular group has a long history of brachytherapy. That's kind of what our group's original expertise was. And so we have sort of designed our, when we got into the stereotactic body radiotherapy and the cyber knife and things like that, we designed our treatment to be very similar to high dose rate brachytherapy. And so my colleague, Dr. Fuller, designed his original trial based on um, radiation techniques developed at my alma mater at Beaumont, uh, which was mimicking the same dose and style of treatment of the high dose rate brachytherapy implant. And so the characteristic of sparing the urethra with this horseshoe shaped high dose region, this is what a classic brachytherapy plan looks like. And this is what a cyber knife plan looks like. And you can tell, well, I mean, for maybe to the non-scientific eye, it's not as obvious, but these are very, very similar on paper. So basically you're delivering a very similar dose distribution, but you're able to do it in a non-invasive fashion. And of course, this is a little bit less user dependent than this one, which is a little bit more dependent on the skill of the actual um, physician. Both of them require some skill, but this is a little bit less in terms of you know, uh, uh, operative skill. Now, this is what a typical uh, cyber knife plan looks like. Here, you can see the non-coplanar beams coming in from hundreds of different directions. Now, each one of these little beamlets is one 200th of the dose, for example. And so right a millimeter outside of the prostate, you have one 200th of the dose, but where they're intersecting directly on the gland, you have 200 times, uh, or in this case, 130 times more powerful uh, the dose. And again, this is just typical, you know, three-dimensional reconstruction of the plan. And so that's essentially what we're looking at. Now, when I first started giving this talk about CyberKnife, it was a much more experimental thing. It's become much more mainstream. So some of these, these slides that I'm now presenting are a little bit more outdated because now we actually have a lot more data. But 
a lot of patients and, and a lot of physicians would ask us because they had never heard of CyberKnife before and they never heard of, you know, serotactin by radiotherapy, is this a standard treatment option? And previously, no, it wasn't. You did have to um, go on clinical trials and things like that. Now we have a pretty good amount of data for um, low and low intermediate risk disease, enough where there's actually, they're now launching phase three clinical trials. And the current guidelines now um, allow this as a standard option in low and low intermediate risk disease. And we actually have now a clinical protocol open for um, treating high risk and high intermediate risk uh, that we're currently enrolling on. So one of the main bodies that comes up with our guidelines for cancer treatment is something called the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. It's an alliance of the 25 large um, cancer programs that uh, review the existing scientific data and they provide expert opinion to develop practice guidelines to help physicians and patients make informed decisions. So they now consider this to be a standard treatment option in practices with appropriate technology, physics, and clinical expertise, because this does require, um, uh, you know, it does require a practice that's pretty familiar with, with doing this, um, because it's a little bit more of an advanced form of radiation therapy and the planning is a little more complex. Um, so I'm not going to go through all of the data because I don't want to bore you. I know this is a community talk and not more of a, a, a scientific talk. But in general, uh, the published data uh, has demonstrated excellent biochemical progression-free survival and similar early toxicity in terms of bladder, rectum, quality of life um, compared to standard radiation therapy techniques. The pooled analysis, one of the publications I'm just presenting here, um, show the five-year biochemical relapse survival to be very similar to most of the other modalities that are out there. Um, this is by our colleague, Chris King, uh, who was originally at Stanford and is now at UCLA. Um, there are multiple ongoing, actually, phase three trials comparing SBRT to IMRT. There's one, being, uh, one that's actually been published in Europe. And then this is from my colleague, Dr. Vargas. He and I did uh, residency, actually, together um, that are comparing uh, phase three trials where they're randomly assigned patients to IMRT and stereotactic you know, body radiotherapy. And the preliminary results currently show that the, that the toxicity rates are similar, but of course that the SBRT is of course a lot shorter. So this is just an older side comparing the clinical outcomes. You can see here, uh, 3D treatment, IMRT, proton therapy, CyberKnife, high dose rate brachytherapy and LDR. The toxicities are uh, relatively similar with CyberKnife having you know, a very good toxicity profile. Biochemical control rates are very similar between all of these uh, uh, modalities. And uh, um, uh, this is for patients who are interested. If you want to dig into some of the data, this is a selection of some of the publications. As you, as you can see, nowadays, we have actually quite a bit, you know, um, there, there's quite a number of publications that have been done. And we were actually acquiring data even at our own institution, um, uh, kind of outlining this. So who is a candidate for CyberKnife? So right now, as a standard of care option, it's mainly done in low and favorable intermediate risk patients. And um, if you don't know what that is, I can explain that. It has to do with your Gleason score and your stage and things like this and your PSA, whose cancer has not spread. Um, you can do this five treatments uh, at, a, at an experienced center. Um, and that's a very reasonable option for patients who are looking at treating their prostate cancer. For unfavorable intermediate and high risk patients, the data is still accumulating. Um, we do have a protocol open at our center, which mimics the data of high dose rate brachytherapy, where they do it in combination with 28 of the external beam radiation, and then they would boost the prostate with a high dose rate brachytherapy implant. And instead, we're doing the exact same thing, but we're boosting it with a cyber knife um, boost instead of a high dose rate brachytherapy boost. Um, generally, this is preferred to be done on a clinical trial uh, as the data matures. Um, preliminarily, we've seen very good results of this, but we always encourage patients to, of course, they should be on, you know, ideally on a clinical study if they're, do, if they're doing this for um, the higher risk patients. The other thing that's been very fascinating is that in the instance where prostate cancer has come back, where you have a, a, a radiation failure, let's say a patient's been treated with radiation and then their prostate cancer grew back in the prostate cancer itself. Now, that's not a very common scenario. But in the past, there were very few salvage options. You either had to do surgery, but the surgeons don't really like operating in a previously radiated field. A lot of side effects with that because of the prior scar tissue. Uh, you can develop adhesions and, and, and you know, healing issues. Um, or you had to do a high dose rate brachytherapy implant, which is again, one of the things our center, you know, one of my partners actually specializes in this. He's published uh, uh, on this. 
um, which has pretty good results with hyperthermia. But now we're actually using CyberKnife uh, to do re-irradiation. And, and preliminarily, we, 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 you know, there's been pretty good results. There's actually, again, our, our colleagues in San Diego have published on this, and there are other publications looking at this. And so that's something that we have uh, started doing. Again, a clinical trial is preferred. We also use it for metastatic disease to, of course, treat cancer that is spread to the spine, the brain, and then other areas of the body. Um, this is our clinical trial that's open at our particular center um, at clinicaltrials.gov. We are currently enrolling patients that have localized prostate cancer across the entire spectrum, low, intermediate, and high-risk patients. So that's kind of my summary. I hope I've left enough time for questions and answers. Um, so what I'm going to do is, uh, let's see here. I will turn it back over to the hosts and, and uh I'm not sure if we're going to do, I, I, I'm going to stop sharing my screen here for a minute. Um, and let's see here. Can everybody hear me now? Okay. We have a, we have a question for you, doctor. How long, actually it's a compound question. How long, is the how long does cyber does the cyber knife procedure take, and with that, how long is the patient does the patient have to remain still, and what happens if the patient moves? Uh, what are the consequences? Um, how many treatment sessions with cyber knife? One session, multiple sessions. If you want, I'll repeat that. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Okay. Um, yes, I can hear you, Neil. Okay. I was, I was on mute. microphone working, but I'm, I'm kind of looking. Dave, can you hear me okay? You seem to be muted. Yes, you're muted, Dave. Dave, I am out loud. Doctor, can you hear me? The doctor appears to be muted, and I can't unmute. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, my, there my muted? okay. Oh, there we go. There now, now, can you hear me okay? Yes. Can you repeat yes. the question? Ah, much better. Okay. I, I okay. think you can unmute yourself if you would like to speak. So I, okay, had, to, I had to unmute myself. The doctor was um, muted, but he's unmuted now. Okay. So... Um, I guess in terms of how long the CyberKnife procedure lasts, um, it depends. Every patient is a little bit different depending on the number of beams we use, the size of the prostate, and things like that. The average treatment typically lasts between anywhere from as little as 30 minutes to about an hour and a half. Um, now, during that time, yes, the patient, the, the more still the patient lays, the faster the treatment will go. But it's different than conventional radiation in that if the patient moves, the cyber knife. Do you want to hear this? I said, no, I just asked you. Are you still listening to this? Yes. Oh, sorry. The cyber knife system can automatically detect that motion and will automatically either correct for that motion, but when it corrects for the motion, it has to make an adjustment and then verify it. So by doing that, it ends up extending the treatment time. So generally, we try to have the patients lay as still as possible but we don't have to come up with a special immobilization and back locks and some of these things. Those are not as critical with the cyber knife uh, system. Um, usually we have patients, you know, um, bring, uh, sometimes they can bring music to listen to or a, a, a book on tape or things like that. Cause it is, it is kind of boring. You have to lay there for, um, for that entire time. Now, most patients get five treatments. Um, our center, I generally prefer to do the treatments every other day, unless the patient is in a rush. You can do the five treatments in a row. But what we found in our experience is that if you do the treatments every other day, you tend to have less swelling of the prostate gland, and that way you have less urinary symptoms in terms of um, uh, urinary frequency and swelling. So that's our usually our preferred method. Um, and generally, is it one session? No, it's usually five sessions uh, for most patients. Four to five, but we typically prefer the five session treatment. Okay, thank you. Uh, how much does this cost the patient with no insurance coverage? Uh, so most insurance companies nowadays will cover it. Uh, 
every once in a while you have um, an insurance company that does not cover it. And usually we're able to get it covered by appealing. Um, if a patient was to come from out of the country or to pay cash for it, I don't know what the cost would be off the top of my head. Um, but certainly we do have patients come internationally and we've had patients come and pay all cash. And that would be something our department manager could probably answer in terms of that. I, I don't know how much it costs for paying out of pocket for something like that. So basically you're, you're looking at booking an appointment to have an examination and then uh, based on that examination or review of the records, you would then be uh, talking to the office manager about what your out of pocket would be. Exactly. Whether it, and, and and you know even whether it's with insurance or without insurance, yeah, we have a um, we have a, a, a one of our employees, one of our staff members, um, specializes in the insurance. They usually will contact the patient's insurance, and um, they're a good resource to talk to about copays and you know deductibles and things like that. Um, I unfortunately am not as knowledgeable about that, so I don't know. I know the basics, but I don't know, you know, in detail about this one. But um, I think it also depends on, you know, for our out of country patients that come, uh, it often depends on, you know, if, if they're going to need an MRI or a biopsy or fiducials or, you know, the, or, or if they're already, you know, kind of worked up or not and, and things like this. Okay, thank you. Uh, how many physicians are available um, that can do CyberKnife and brachytherapy procedures. Can we learn more about this uh, by reading about it in a book or other sources to learn more about CyberKnife? Yeah, absolutely. Our website has a lot of good information on it. It's uh, uh, cyberknife.oc.org. Um, there's a number of you know video and resources and things like that. Um, also, cyberknife.com is the Accuray website. Um, it also has a lot of information about it. It also has a list of centers. Now, CyberKnife is kind of like the um, you know, colloquially, it's like the sort of the Rolls Royce of the stereotactic body radiotherapy world. So there's not as many systems around. They tend to be very expensive systems. You know, the machines are, are you know, multi-million dollar systems. So you don't have one in every street corner. Um, but um, there are a number of centers in California. Um, uh, and if you go to their website, it sort of shows where each of these CyberKnife centers are. Um, so um, it is a more of a specialty field. So the average kind of radiation center is not going to have a cyber knife there. But regionally within a, in a major metropolitan area, you will usually have a, a cyber knife in, in most metropolitan areas around the United States. Um, different centers have different experience with prostate cancers. Not all cyber knife centers treat prostate. Some of them treat a lot of prostate. Some of them treat very little prostate. It just depends on what their setup is. Uh, brachytherapy, same way. It's more of a subfield of radiation oncology. So prostate brachytherapy uh, is not done by all radiation oncologists. It's only done by radiation oncologists who have kind of done additional training or who have done you know, higher volume of that. Um, most radiation oncologists are trained in external beam and then they do additional training to get comfortable with brachytherapy or with uh, stereotactic body radiotherapy. Okay. Uh, what are the, I mean, we got three, we have a, a, a an audience member here that's, that's looking at comparing three different kinds of treatments and, mm -hmm. and uh, perhaps learning what advantages there are of cyber knife versus let's say cryogenic treatment or mm -hmm. uh, surgery such as uh, prostatectomy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a wonderful question. Um, so I think that, uh, 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 you know, cryotherapy or cryogenic therapy is a little bit less of a mainstream option. So the American Neurologic Association, the American Society of Radiation Oncology, and the NCCN um, don't currently consider that to be one of the more mainstream options, mainly because the current data that we have available for cryogenic or freezing the prostate gland um, has shown, um, you know, comparatively has shown uh, uh, lower rates of biochemical control with higher side effects. So usually we don't talk too much about cryotherapy, but in terms of surgery, which is a very standard treatment option and cyber knife, um, the main advantage of surgery uh, is that if you're a good surgical candidate, um, your gland is out in, in a bucket and, and gone, which is one of the advantages. It's sort of a one and done type of procedure. 
Um, the disadvantages, of course, is that you have to be operated on. Um, the advantages of CyberKnife is that it's, it's a less invasive treatment option, so especially for patients who may not be great surgical candidates. Um, they have comorbidities or you know, heart attacks or strokes or, or the surgeon doesn't feel they're a good candidate. Um, it's a less invasive uh, technique. Um, it, it does require multiple trips to the, uh, you know, to the center to do that. The side effect profile is also a little bit different. You know, surgery, of course, has the risks of um, uh, uh, anesthesia, infection, and bleeding. And the primary risks of surgery um, are uh, uh, having impotence, which is um, if you cut the nerves, you controlling the erections, um, you know, impotence can get affected, or incontinence, which is leakage of urine when you sew the urethra back together again. Now, those risks can be relatively minimal in the hands of a good skilled surgeon. Um, in the same way, CyberKnife, because we're not actually cutting anything, um, we don't usually have a risk of incontinence or, um, you know, but, and we're not cutting the nerves, so we don't completely wipe out erections, but, um, but we can cause, um, CyberKnife can cause decreased blood flow and scarring around the area, which can lead to weaker erectile function over time. So kind of a more gradual weakening of erectile function. Um, and it does cause more swelling of the prostate gland, which can lead to more ure uh, urinary symptoms, such as um, having to go to the bathroom more often or going more urgently. Um, also, there can be some more dose to the rectum compared to surgery, because of course, you know, you're having to put these beams through. But of course, with some of these modern techniques, you can minimize that. So that's kind of a rough overview. I mean, you know, you can get into a huge, long, detailed discussion, but that's just kind of a, a shorter answer to that question. Okay. Uh, what side of uh, let's let's talk about side effects and uh, and uh, uh, what happen what, what kinds of things can happen if there's operator error if things go wrong and of course side effects. Yeah, so uh, the biggest thing I think in in designing the plan. Um, there's a couple different factors which are user dependent and a couple of different things which are just based on the nature of the treatments themselves. So um, one, of the, one of the things that uh, is more user dependent and which is one of the reasons why you want to be at a high volume center is um, a radiation oncologist will actually contour the prostate gland, the urethra, the rectum and the bladder. And of course, you know, it's sort of like garbage in garbage out. You can have the fanciest software and technology but if that contouring is not completely accurate, for example, if you're contouring into the rectum or in, into the bladder, um, and some of these things can be a little nuanced, then uh, no matter how good your system is, you're gonna be putting dose into the rectum or dose into the bladder or dose into the urethra. The second thing is you need to have a very skilled uh, physics or technical team because these treatment plans are extraordinarily complex. For every single beam that's going through the patient, there are calculations in terms of tissue density and whether you're going through bone or tissue or air or water. And the planning techniques, which angles you come in with, how you do the plan, how long the patient is on the table versus, um, you know, uh, you, can, you can come up with plans that are extraordinarily accurate and have very high levels of image guidance, but then it could take three hours to treat the patient, um, which, is, which is not a realistic thing. Or you can have very sloppy plans, which you treat very quickly in, in, in just 10, 15 minutes, but then you may not have the precision. So there's balances and nuances in terms of those things. So that's kind of where the, um, where the expertise and skill comes in. Also how to incorporate MRI scans into the planning process and space aware and some of these things. Um, in terms of the side effects though, in general, even with an optimal plan, uh, the biggest side effect of CyberKnife is of course swelling of the prostate because the, you know, you're delivering a big dose to the prostate gland. And so when, when the prostate gland swells because the urethra goes right through the center, it can cause compression. And a lot of, you know, as we age, as a lot of men age, uh, the prostate gland tends to enlarge and people tend to get up more often at night and CyberKnife can exacerbate that, especially in the two to three weeks following the treatment. So there's acute side effects and then chronic side effects. So the acute side effects are in the short period where there's temporary swelling of the gland. And that's where you can mitigate that by doing it every other day and doing some of these other things. But it's when you gotta go, you gotta go, burning with urination, going more often. The statistical probability of having what's called a grade three or greater toxicity, that's kind of the really bad toxicities, long-term, like 
you know, like having, you know, an ulcer in the bladder where your surgeon has to go in and fulgurate it or, or these kind of things is extremely uncommon, like uh, less than most of the published data shows it to be less than two to 3% risk of that happening. Um, same thing with like developing a rectal ulcer, developing a fistula or a stricture, things like this. Um, and then of course, with any treatment, regardless of whether you use surgery or radiation or cyber knife, the goal of the treatment is to destroy the prostate gland. So even if you're able to have an erection and even if you're able to ejaculate, the amount of fluid that comes out is always going to be less because you've destroyed you know, the gland that actually produces that seminal fluid. So that is there. Um, in addition, you know, over time, as we get older, the erections can get weaker and, uh, and radiation, whether it's CyberKnife or any of the radiation systems, can accelerate that process. Now, there are techniques to mitigate that, like, you know, some people, you know, some of the studies have shown if you take Viagra every single day, if you, um, uh, you know, the more sexually active you are, the stronger your erections are before treatment, if you don't have Lupron therapy, then you can preserve the erectile function, you know, to a higher degree, especially people who are non-smokers, things like this. Um, so that's kind of uh, some of the things. Then, of course, the rectum, people can get uh, hemorrhoidal irritation or diarrhea or loose stools. Those are some of the other uh, common things that can potentially happen with any radiation option. Thank you. Uh, how does this compare to, say, a laser technique like HIFU? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, similar, similar to cryotherapy, HIFU and cryotherapy, um, you know, they are the data on those relative to um, some of the radiation and surgical options is much more limited. It's less commonly done in the United States um, because of that re reason. HIFU was actually uh, recently approved um, by the FDA, but still hasn't gained mainstream acceptance because the published data to date has shown inferior outcomes to some of the more traditional options with higher levels of side effects. So again, the American Neurologic Association, American Society of Radiation Oncology, NCCN, they generally don't use HIFU or cryo as a standard option. It is sometimes used in salvage options, you know, when patients have had uh, uh, failures and the cancer comes back and you need to salvage it, 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 it can be a good option for those patients. Um, but, uh, but, but that's, um, you know, that's kind of the general sort of mainstream thinking about, uh, about those techniques. Well, thank you. Does anyone else have a question they'd like to ask? Um, I, we, we have a little bit of time left and we're going to go into uh, finding out how we all did tonight. All right, if I don't see anything posted here in group chat. Um, David, so, so, Neil, why don't you um, just make sure um, no one raises their hand or something and wants to get a question in. Does, does, right. any, does anyone want to get a question directly to the doctor. You, you might have to unmute your um, audio and ask your question, please. Yeah, thanks, Dave. I'm strictly working off a group chat here. So going once, going twice, does anyone have a- Wait a minute, William has a question. William, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Okay, well, personal experience. In 2013, I had the, the uh, IMRT. My PSA was like 7.9, Gleason 6, and I was radiated the 40-some uh, procedures. Mm -hmm. uh, but the problem was I ended up getting burned pretty bad, external burns, internal burns, and the rectum, in which case I had to go in and they first tried to stop the bleeding with, uh, they said it was some kind of an argon rays. Argon laser, yeah. And then I had three sessions where they did some kind of caustic procedure. They went in to uh, burn the area. And mm -hmm. that, that finally stopped the bleeding. Very uncomfortable doing it, but it stopped the bleeding. Well, now the PSA is back up to 8.6 again and still going up. Mm. Uh, what are my options? Uh, so far as cyber knives concerned, yeah. So we, you know, we so looking at an individual case, of course, we'd have to review things in a lot more detail. But we'd have to first make sure the prostate cancer hasn't spread to any other area of the body, and if it has not, then potentially, uh, if if the cancer is still just located in the prostate, cyber knife may be a salvage option. But the way you're describing your side effects seem seem pretty horrendous. 
And mm -hmm. so um, those are, that's not a typical experience with uh, modern radiotherapy is very unusual. You know, like I mentioned, uh, less than uh, two to three percent of patients would have those kind of complications. So, um, so we'd have to, you know, again, I mean, on a overall perspective, yes, if somebody has had radiation before and then they fail directly in the prostate gland, cancer is nowhere else, CyberKnife could be an option for them. You as an individual patient, of course, we'd have to, you know, we'd have to meet and figure out whether that's something that would be possible or not. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Anybody else? Anybody else want to wave their hand and ask a question? <clears throat> Well, I'd like to ask the doctor, you're, you're, you said how old was your equipment at your facility? Uh, I'm sorry? I asked how old has your equipment been at your facility? So we've had, we've, we've been open the current, so we, we have three locations. We have Saddleback Memorial, Orange Coast Memorial, and Long Beach Memorial. And we have different <laughs> machines at each place. So. At our Long Beach facility, we have a tomotherapy unit and we have a relatively newer system called Varian Edge. Uh, that was actually just installed earlier this year. Um, at Orange Coast Memorial is where we have the CyberKnife and we have a Varian Linear Accelerator similar to the one that I've shown you. That center opened about 10 years ago. Um, and then at our Saddleback facility, we have something called the uh, Varian True Beam. And then we have another system called Vital Beam, which are kind of later model um, uh, 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 external beam, you know, radiation systems. Most of our high dose rate brachytherapy for prostate cancer is done at our Long Beach facility. Most of the cyber knife uh, is done at Orange Coast Memorial. And, um, you know, so different centers have different, you know, technologies. We have Vision RT at different places and things like that. But I asked about how, how long. How, how old how, are the systems? Yeah. Or, yeah, so the CyberKnife, so, so the uh, systems at, at uh, Saddleback and at Long Beach are relatively new. The, the Long Beach one was just installed, I think, about three, four months ago. Um, let's see, we're in July. Yeah, so it went operational about three to four months ago. The, uh, but of course, the centers have been around for decades, but this is just the equipment. Um, so we're constantly, you know, we continuously upgrade it to different locations. Um, the Saddleback Center, I want to say, is probably one of the machines is maybe a year or two old. The other one's probably about uh, three or four years old, maybe three years old. And the uh, equipment at um, Orange Coast is now about 10 years old. The, those machines don't look cheap. That, they, they're generally multi-million dollar machines. You know, the CyberKnife, for example, is about five million dollars. Okay. Um, the uh, most linear accelerators, brand new, are usually about a couple million dollars, depending, you know, up to three or four million, depending on, on how many add-ons you put. Uh, you know, we also have Brain Lab, um, which is another stereotactic uh, add-on that we have at Cyber, you know, at, at our um, uh, Saddleback facility, which also offers uh, SBRT treatments. Um, and then we have um, uh, uh, what's something called Vision RT, which is surface guided radiation therapy that we use called SGRT. Um, and that's uh, available um, also on some of our newer equipment. So the last question I got is, when do you think you'll be out of the trial state and really, um, you know, whatever the approval is, FDA, when, when would you have it so it's mainstreamed treatment? For CyberKnife? Yes. Uh, I think for CyberKnife is already FDA approved and for low and low intermediate risk, it is already considered mainstream now. So, um, so currently it is considered uh, like um, a standard treatment option by all of the national bodies. Again, the American Neurologic Association, the NCCN and the, and ASTRO, which is our kind of our three main uh, bodies. So they all consider SBRT to be a standard treatment option for low and low intermediate risk disease. Now, high, inter high risk, high intermediate dis risk disease, or what's called unfavorable intermediate or high risk, that the data is still accumulating. Um, it's probably going to be another, you know, three, four years before that starts to become, you know, before the data matures on that. All right. Thank you. So I think we may just have one more question here. Uh, and then I think we're going to close questions and, and go to our survey. Uh, are side effects increased by using fewer higher dose treatments? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a very, very good question. In general, that was the concern when they started initially doing these trials. But what they found was that the 
rectal side effects are actually decreased just because of the nature of the treatment. But the urinary acute side effects tend to be increased in the immediate post-treatment period, but seem to be similar in the long, you know, over the long run. So the short answer to that question is that it doesn't appear to be the case. Um, all of the data we have to date shows very similar toxicity profiles. Now, the, the best type of clinical data is, you know, they have phase one clinical trials, phase two clinical trials, and phase three clinical trials. Phase three is where you randomly assign patients to one treatment and the other. So right now, for example, IMRT and, and CyberKnife treatment. That trial is currently being done, and that will provide the best data to answer that question. But based on the phase one and phase two trials, no, it doesn't really seem to be a difference. And the initial data from the phase three trial, which I think I showed in one of the slides there, um, shows similar toxicity profiles, does not show increased side effects from doing it over a shorter period of time. But that's where, you know, that's where some of this phase three data would be very helpful. Outstanding. Thank you very much, doctor. All right. I hope this was helpful and beneficial. And uh, yes. um, yeah. Thank you so much. No problem. You all have a great night and take it easy. I apologize if it's okay with the organizers. I'm going to have to drop off the call. I, um, I thank you very much for your time. We all thank you for your time. And we look forward to having you back again. Yes. Thank you, doctor. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Neil, do you want the uh, last chart? Just the last chart, please. Okay. Uh, this is the point where we get to learn from you. Uh, and, and four questions here. I hope everybody can see them. I'll read them. Uh, what did you like about the Zoom meeting format? What was the speak? Did you find the speaker subject matter relevant? And what could we do to uh, about what we could do? What could we improve about the presentation? And what uh, future topics would you like to see? If, if you prefer not to answer verbally, we will have a, a, uh, a questionnaire going around by constant contact probably tomorrow, I hope no later than Saturday. All right, and I will say um, it's my intent to We've recorded the doctor's presentation in this question and answer, and um, I will uh, make an effort to get this by Saturday on YouTube. Um, there's some delay for me process and uploading, so. All right, we had as many, Neil, as 32 participants that I wow. observed, and so I think we had a good start. Thank you for um, everyone that came along and and uh, it's a big jump in technology and, and uh, thank you for your patience. And um, is there anything else we wanna say before we sign off, Neil? I just, the only other thing is that there's our, our address again. And, and of course it appears on all of our communications. It's our mail address. And we do have certain costs that come with this. We do have to pay insurance, we do have to pay uh, for Zoom and for constant contact, we are still paying rent. So if you can, uh, please go ahead and, and uh, mail a voluntary donation to us. We would certainly appreciate it in lieu of passing the baskets around. Uh, we would certainly appreciate it and it would certainly help keep us uh, producing pro programs like this. If there are no other questions, would you like to uh, close the meeting, Dave? Well, yes, and and this this was uh, quite um, interesting. It's our first major group um, meeting, and so thank you for everyone's attention and and patience. And I hope uh, you found this um, helpful. For it, this was very informative, and I love that doctors sort of video of the cyber knife. That was really cool to see. And some of his illustrations were very good. So, all right, well, I'm gonna sign off. There are good questions. And um, so.
If nothing else, I'm going to hit end and we'll be done for the night. All right. Thank you, Dave. We Thank you. To we'll you. send out a notice for the next meeting. All right. All right, Ira. Thank you. William. Bye. Bye. Rich. Bye now. Bye-bye. Hey, Harvey. Thank you.